You're listening to the podcast of The Branch in Ashland, Virginia. It can be easy for us to sit in the seat of judgment when we see someone different. We may forget that at one time or another, we've been in a similar place of difference. Jesus broke through the difference to meet people, to show them their value, and to love them so much that it propelled them to go and share what they'd experienced. In today's episode, we meet a woman who Jesus loves in such a way. Well, y'all, it's good to be with you. Um, I've been here once before. I don't know how many of you know me. My name's Cron Gibson, no relation to John. Um, That's my son. Some of you know Sam and uh, Taryn. Uh, They're our son and daughter-in-law. It's always fun for me to come to a church plant. My wife and I are church planters from way back. We've planted three churches, much like John did, largely as a scratch operation, except, you know, we didn't do the pandemic thing, you know. John felt like having a bigger challenge than we ever desired. But it's always fun for us to come and be a part of a plant because you guys get to know each other. You get to serve with each other. You don't get to have kind of um, an enculturated, invisible faith. And it makes us understand Jesus in a very different way. And that's kind of where I'm going to go with you today. We're going to talk today about um, love is missional. And it's important to know that coffee is part of mission. I would like to highlight that. Let me get this open here for a second. Um, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it. And I don't know if John does this, but this is my own, my own history. Would you mind standing while we just read the word together? We're going to be in Luke chapter 7, uh, verses 36 to 50. Luke chapter 7, 36 to 50. And I'll just read. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he, he Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that she, he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought in an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair of her head, kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would have known who it was and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender and two debtors owed 500 denarii and the other 50, what they, which they could not pay. He canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, Well, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. You know, I, what I do for a living anymore, so I'm a teaching elder in the EPC, so I have a Master Divinity, you know, I've run all the reformed gauntlets to get ordained, and I'm also a marriage and family therapist. I run a nonprofit counseling center, and I coach planters and the like. And the way my mind works, when I read things, invariably I'm thinking connection of ideas and relationships. So when I read the Gospels, my mind is always tracking characters in a story. This story is interesting to me because you have several people or groups of people that are embedded in it that model different responses to Jesus, different understandings of what it means to love, to have relationship with himself and other. And then you see the mess of it, and into this, Jesus comes and rearranges everything. Now, I don't know about you. I always say, Lord, come, except when he comes and he starts to rearrange everything. I don't always like the method or the model with which he rearranges. Anybody ever, you know, struggle with that? I can remember early in our married life, uh, my wife and I had a huge argument. I don't remember what it was about, but, you know, I was a pastor already. So we've only had one, so it was a teaching illustration. 
Um, isn't that right, son? Okay, he's nodding, good. So, but I remember this one vividly because I was, I was infuriated, my feelings were hurt, so you know, I go back up, I'm upstairs in our home, I'm sitting in our bedroom, and I'm like, Lord, help. And it was plain as day, it was like I heard the voice of the Lord, I will go love her. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not where we were going with this. You know what help means? It means go talk to her, have her realize she's bad, I'm good, and she can come and repair everything, right? Because that's what love does, right? Amen? Right, okay. So when we come into dealing with Jesus, that's obviously not exactly how love works. So I want to invite you as we walk across this passage to see with whom you identify as we unpack some principles of love and forgiveness. I want to invite you to wrestle with to what end did Jesus offer you his love and forgiveness? Was it to put you into a safe cul-de-sac where we can build fences and feel okay? Or is his love always missional? Because Jesus is on mission. He came to seek and to save the lost. He came to serve, not to be served. The highest ethic perhaps in the world you can find in Ephesians 5.1, it says, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. So as one who is loved by the Father in the name and the work of the Son, we are invited to imitate the very one whose love is missional and to live a life of, on mission because of him and his profound love for us. What you'll see as we engage the text is for the most part, they didn't want to see the groups of people in view, didn't really want to sit still and see Jesus. They wanted to judge people around them, keep a distance from the messy work of the kingdom. Let me just pray for us and we'll dive in. Father God, thank you that you love us, that Jesus, when you came to seek and save the lost, you had me and my family, my friends gathered here, people down the street, the people walking by, that you had the nations in view, that you had Ashland and Richmond and Virginia and the world in view. So today as we unpack your word, Lord Jesus, will you open our eyes to see you more clearly? Holy Spirit, will you come and persuade us much more deeply of the profound, sure, and certain love of the Father for his children whose names he knows, that we might, out of that great love, simply have a life of delighted worship where we reflect you more and more readily. Come, Lord Jesus, come and have your way. Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So Christians, people who profess to believe in Jesus, hold, in, at least implicitly, if you don't know it clearly in the scriptures, that we're designed for a relationship, a perfect relationship with him, a relationship with self, and a relationship with other. We are designed to live securely anchored out of those key relationships and work in the world as a reflection of the love that has been poured out to us. But we have a problem with that. I will sometimes say tongue-in-cheek, I run a counseling ministry, and let's just say you've come to see me at your first day. I can tell you're really anxious and nervous about being so vulnerable because people walk into a counselor's office, and there's a part of that. It's not quite like going to the internist, but you take a different set of clothes off. It's time to reveal the mess under the hood, and people get anxious. You can think of it this way. John and I are sitting having a cup of coffee, and you walk into the coffee shop, and John introduces you, and you sit down for a minute. We're chatting for a second, and I look at you, and I go, hey, you know you're needy, right? Does that sound like I just said something nasty to you? Yes. Why? Because we have believed that being needy is a negative idea. But God created us needy to be known by him. He said to Adam before Eve, it's not good for you to be alone. He intended us for connection. And even in the beginning, he gave imperative to go into the world, even before sin had come. But to be vulnerable is terrifying. So if I look at you and I say, hey, I've got five, you've got to do one of two things in the next five minutes or you're going to die. You can go out in the lobby. I've got 10 people. There's five you'll know, five you don't know. And you have to strip emotionally absolutely butt naked. 
There's no darkness in you, no secret sin that doesn't have to come out into the light. So that's option one. Or you can strip butt naked and there's gravel in the parking lot. You can keep your shoes on and take a naked lap around the building and come back in, right? Now, if we're honest, what are most of us going to do? Hold the door. I'll be right back. (laughs) Well, why? Because deeply embedded in all of us is something that sin destroyed, an embedded belief that if we reveal ourselves, if we do the vulnerable work of letting ourselves be loved, which is the call of our great king, it will not go well with our souls. We will be undone. And so in our wounded, broken world, we have built all kinds of walls to letting ourselves know the love we're designed to have. And as a consequence, often have little love to give away to a world in need. As God's people act like orphans, just like the world, we have to take care of ourselves. And Jesus is a great adjunct to that because I know he loves me while I watch Netflix. And let me be clear, I'm not saying Netflix is sin. I watch Netflix. Okay. So what I want you to identify is we all have ways of managing Jesus, managing others, avoiding love, minimizing our need and the scope of it for us that protects us from having to engage the world in the living love and hope and faith of Christ. So when we come into this text, there's three principles I'm going to give you. Principle one, love is blind to difference, and it will always draw us to go to dangerous places. Principle two is going to be love destroys law unless you hold to the law, and it will destroy love. Principle three is forgiveness drives missional love. So here we go. Let's enter the text. So Jesus has been invited by Simon the Pharisee to dinner. You don't really pick up to right at the end of the story that there's lots of other people there. There's people at the table. There's probably a crowd outside. And so in this, at the table, we're at the Pharisee's house. So the Pharisee is there. It's only a moment before the woman of the city who is a sinner who is unclean. So she's probably known as an adulteress or perhaps a prostitute. But she has heard that the Savior is at table. Now, if you don't know, in it, the way this worked at the, in the ancient Near East, if you invite, it's different than us. You know, you invite us, my wife and I, over for dinner. We come and we sit up straight at your kitchen table or your dining room table. In the ancient Near East, at table, there would be a spread low on the floor, and we would lay down, perhaps on our sides, on our stomachs, looking forward, and our feet would be behind us. So we face inward, and the feet are outward. So Jesus is at table, and he's probably looking straight at Simon and whoever else is there at the table. And this woman of the city who is unclean has shown up, and she begins to wash his feet. She begins to pour out all that she has on the Savior. And there's no exchange from her. She just weeps at the king's feet. At the same time, we have Simon the Pharisee who sits and evaluates, and I love the little bit of text here. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him, Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, in all likelihood, it's he thought to himself, now just sit there. And Jesus looks right at him in response to the unspoken words that are coming out of him. In other words, what does Jesus do? He looks at the Pharisee and he says, I see you and I hear you. I know the self-righteousness of your heart. I know what you're thinking. I have a question for you, Simon. May I ask it? Now, that's dangerous to me, right? It's like if Jesus says, let me ask you something. My brain goes back to Job when God says to Job, okay, my turn. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Can you tell me where the lightning comes from? How the stars got into space? And he rolls out all these things, and and it's like Job is like, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I'm an idiot. I won't say anything else. Or when Paul says, let me ask you a question, and there's a series of them that roll out, we don't have the answers because they're piercing. And so Simon the Pharisee, who is sitting quietly in this place, he hasn't invited Jesus to know Jesus. He's invited Jesus 
to judge the righteous judge. What an irony. You see, the Pharisee, Simon, had a set of laws, rules in his head, religious rules, cultural rules, with which he evaluates everybody around him. He's at the head of his table. He's religiously upright. He has political power in a theocratic society. So he judges the Savior. He's got the sycophants, the people who just kind of agree with him at the table who are just observing this. And then you hear the judgment as he judges the woman and as he judges the Savior. See, the essence of legalism, which he is capturing, John Piper put this way, the essence of legalism is when faith is not the engine of obedience. To say I am right or good, rather than to identify if the person has loved well while ignoring or denying my own deep need for the love of the one who is present with me, the Savior, is the root of our unbelief and our legalism that frees believers and unbelievers alike to justify all kinds of life. So let me ask you a question. Broadly speaking, we build rules and laws to protect us from Jesus, to protect us from where love would take us, the vulnerability and the missional nature of love. Some of us like to sit as the judge or the criticizer. Let's touch that for a moment. Are you, do you tend to correct the universe around you? Like, wh- or you just, why did they do that? How come they, and th- you can hear that, why did you, how come they? There is a problem located, and where is it? It's over there. So you like to hold yourself more in this one-up position that frees you from facing yourself and having to do the messy work of the kingdom to engage with broken and wounded people. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Some of us are just good at that. Others of us tend to go the other way. Now, I'm a recovering people pleaser. Sometimes my wife says, please recover faster, pleaser. And so I tend to not want to say the hard thing. I'll come over and engage with somebody, but I won't speak any painful truths at times because I don't want you to be upset with me. So my target to avoid love looks a little bit more like love, but it's actually a model of avoidance that still is about protecting me. So, and some of you, to use a cultural world, word, maybe a little bit by, you can do both of those in a quite talented fashion. But if we posit a question, we say, why do you want to? What is it in the heart, your heart, that does not want to sit still and see actually the scope of your profound need for Jesus? Because if we come back to the table for a moment, it's kind of a picture of a worship service, right? If we picture Jesus at the table as the pastor or the preacher, except he was better at it than John or I are, and he actually knew the word because he was the word at a deeper level that I will, than I will ever know, so the pastor is at the table, and you, you have the religious figure, the self-righteous one, who's evaluating the sermon rather than hearing the words of the Lord to him. You have the desperate woman who, or, the, or the desperate wounded person who will often sit in the room of a church with a little bit of space around them isolated and people kind of turn and nod but we feel a kind of an uncomfortable vibration so we don't go over and sit down and say are you okay do you have any place to go for dinner today or lunch come be with my family today where do you sit in relation to the king who comes and sits at your table with you for the woman of the city is a picture of the life of worship. Her awareness of her need for Jesus and her love for the only one who she knew would see and accept her propelled an unclean woman to come to the Pharisee's house and consciously or not to publicly declare her hope in the living king by pouring out all she had on his feet. The Pharisee, we could say, 
was inviting the pastor to his home and he looked good. And he wanted to engage Jesus in an intellectual conversation while avoiding his own deep need, which was no different than the woman who was pouring it out at his feet. So now Jesus posits his question, and this takes us to the second principle. Real love will destroy the law, meaning the laws, the rules we keep that w- through which we justify the poverty of our love to our king and justify how poorly or how seldom we risk stepping out to love our neighbor, our coworker, the broken person on the curb. If we do not understand love, our rules will judge and destroy law every time. So Jesus posits now his question. A certain money lender, and he says, which one? The one who owes you, who owed 500 days wages or only 50 days wages, denarii, would love more. And Simon the Pharisee answers correctly, well, I suppose it's the one who obviously was forgiven more. But then notice where Jesus goes. He affirms you have judged rightly. And then he turns and he says, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has wept, wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss But from the time I came, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Now, in the culture of the day, if I am inviting you to my home and you are an honored guest, these are all the things I would have done for you. So Jesus isn't invited to the table as an honored guest. He is invited by the religious to be judged and evaluated and not seen for who he is. Because if Simon had stopped and seen the king for who the king was, Simon would have had no place to stand and judge in his self-righteousness, which is a terrifying thing for any of us to put down. No water. No, no greeting of a holy kiss. No anointing. So here's the idea. The woman of the city knew the profound love of Jesus. And you could tell because her life poured out literally at his feet in worship. All she had. And she declared his mercy to everyone gathered as she did it because love destroyed the judgment of the law. It didn't remove its place, it removed its judgment. I remember when I was in seminary, I went to a Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. While we were there, I ended up working in a, broadly speaking, Evangelical United Methodist Church. And I I remember while we were there, uh, the senior pastor at the time, his name was Sam, not my son, who would have been like 12 or actually five. But Sam, the senior pastor, was preaching. And it was one of the only live broadcasts in the city at the time. And back in the civil rights era, this was a historic church on which violence was perpetrated against the black community on its stairs. So that was a history of crushing self-righteous judgment. In the middle of his sermon broadcast, the door at the back of the sanctuary opened. And a a couple comes running in, and they are clearly what you and I would think of typically as street poor, bag lady. They're not dressed well. They're unkempt. They smell. They have never been in the church. She just heard the broadcast and heard Jesus and grabbed her, I don't know, husband, partner, don't know the relationship, and said, we have to go there. We need to go there now. So she just comes in and comes charging down the, th- up the aisle. Sanctuary probably sat 500 people. Sam stopped. Now hit pause with me. 
What goes through your head in that moment? As she comes running to the front, unkempt, unclean, smelly. You could look around at the congregation. There's like, what's going on? We're out of order. That's not right. The wealthiest person in the congregation, however, Sam stopped and greeted this person, stepped down from the pulpit and spoke with them. And then the wealthiest person who owned a local chain of grocery stores, a woman, got up and wrapped her arms around them and took her to sit with them. What a profound picture. The woman of the city came to the service. The wealthy made room to care. The pastor saw, stopped and saw and engaged the one who came. I remember it vividly because it's so countercultural, but it is gospel centered love, isn't it? So if you and I stop here for a, a moment again and ask the question Simon is obviously self righteously judging. Now, you and I would never do such a thing, would we? I mean, if Jesus came and sat at our table, we'd treat him well. But I want you to wrestle with the notion. This woman has come to sit at the master's feet. And it has changed everything around her and in her. As she and her actions publicly declares her need and love and worship for the one who has called her out of the dark. Who do you walk by every day? Who are you too busy to engage at the baseball field or soccer field as you watch your kids? Ki uh, teenagers, who is the person at your school that they're uncool and you're not going to go sit with them? Parents, which neighbor are we too busy to invite in and just offer the love of Christ to? You see, when we get the love of Jesus, the fruit of that just shows up in how we love our neighbor. The Apostle John, in the little letter at the back of your Bible, 1 John, identifies that we love because he first loved us, but we can't really say we know he loves us if we don't engage the people around us. These are not distinct in a biblical ethic. When I know I'm loved, I emulate the one who loves me be imitators of God as dearly loved children. One of my favorite pictures of my son, I owe you a dollar, when my kids were young, I would tell them if I mentioned their name spontaneously, they get a dollar. <laughs> I don't think I ever coughed up any dough, but one of my favorite pictures of Sam, I, I'm holding him, he was, I don't know, 18 months, two years old, uh, and I have a certain addiction, it's coffee, but fortunately there's no 12-step meetings for that. But I'm holding him, he's looking at me, I was in seminary, and he's holding a coffee cup with the biggest grin on his face. Now to this day, Sam will not drink coffee. I'm praying for repentance, you can pray with me. But why? Daddy loves me and I love my daddy, so I just wanna be like him. And there's a surrender in children that flows from a secure love. And this is a picture that God uses repeatedly. He invites you and me to the liberty and the foolish freedom of a child that knows that he or she is well loved. To talk about our dad in the world because we know his great love for us. Principle three, forgiveness drives missional love. We live in a day that is chaos in a political environment, a secular cultural environment where Jesus' name gets named from whatever position you wanna take. I was read an article a few years ago. Some of you may know the name Michael Gerson. He used to write in the, um, the Washington Post. It was a season of budget debacle. Well, I guess we're still doing that federally at our governmental level. But Tim Scott credited, he was standing against something, his, his opposition to a proposal as a divine inspiration that he had heard from the Lord. Donna Brazile, if you don't know that name, she's a Democratic operative, Democrat leader, and she points out to Jesus saying it was um, Jesus would be fair to these tax increases and support shared sacrifice. 
And I appreciate the language that this writer uses. He says, it wasn't immediately clear whether the Son of God endorses um, corporate loophole closing or prefers tax rate increases. Right? But we name the name of Jesus to justify our positions. Instead of asking Jesus, how would he engage the world with his love that he has engaged us with? I don't know either of these people. I've never had coffee with them. But my own inclination is I think I like Tim Scott. Well, why? Well, I agree with him. He's like me in a position, if you will. So he must be a good person, a good guy. I could get coffee with him. Now, you guys would never do anything like that. Would you view people through a lens of ease and agreement? So imagine picking up your Bible and watching how Jesus engages culture and community. If, it was, if love meant agreement, it's not what it means. Love will always take you to dangerous places. Love will destroy the rules or the laws through which you judge others and I judge others and we justify not offering the love of Christ with acts of service, with words of the gospel, word and deed. But the more I get that he loves me, the more on mission we become as we live out the present hope of Jesus. You see, the woman of the city illustrates the meaning of that statement, the present hope of Jesus. Knowing radically altered her present. It gave her a hope that drove a shameless worshiping surrender. This woman lived in the shadows of society, but just as surely as prostitutes in our modern world, her faith in Jesus propelled her out of her shame into public worship surrounded by the most critical audience you and I could imagine. So we can back out of that for a minute in our culture, and we could think, hey, should I invite a coworker to church? No, they, no. and we pre-choose how they'll respond to us. Hey, should we invite in for dinner? We're really busy. We don't have time for that. We only have time to keep up with the busy Western calendars that we keep. And so how does your calendar reflect the love of Jesus to you as a priority to express to the world around you? And again, I want to be careful. I'm not saying we shouldn't put our kids in sports. I'm not saying we shouldn't have hobbies. I'm asking us to wrestle with what is the organizing principle that drives who we really are. Is Jesus a component, little segment of your worldview? Or is he the one who organizes the lens through which you view your world and your life? We could ask it this way. From what did Jesus save the woman? Well, he saved her from her sin. And, and the outcome of shame and consequence. And often Christians go, that's what I'm saved from. But to what did her faith save her? A realigned life centered around the eternal purposes of the King of Heaven, the Son of Man, the Son of God, who came and gave himself up for us. So when I preach this sermon, I ask me as I ask you, who at the table do you find yourself identifying most readily? The Pharisee who criticizes and judges? The silent members of the church sitting at the table who just watch, kind of take it all in? Or a woman who has lost any form of shame because she knows she's seen by the Savior? And her life pours out all she has in surrender to the good king who knew her name. The closing of the text, Jesus turns to her and he says, your sins are forgiven, your faith is saved, you go in peace. Go love others as Jesus has loved others. Go in the surety that he, the king knows your name and you are his. Go in the great shalom of God and declare it 
to a world desperately in need of you, carrying that word, for how will they know if no one tells them? But we're going to come back to the beginning. It's predicated not on go try harder, but Lord Jesus, I believe you love me, but my heart doesn't believe. Help now my unbelief that I would know more deeply my need of you, more certainly your great love for me, that I would be transformed yet more and more to reflect you into a world in need. It's not a try harder piece. I'm not opening the word saying, go do the right thing. I don't think the woman who came to wash his feet sat in the dark somewhere and went, what's the right thing to do? She saw the king and knew her need and went to the Savior who gave her all that she needed and was propelled back out, go, with the peace of heaven. Men and women, I'd put before you today, that is what Jesus still is declaring to you and me. If you find yourself often in the seat of Simon, a simple prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive my self-righteous judgment of others. How quickly I criticize and condemn people for not living how I want them to be. Show me how much I need you that I would get out of the seat of the judge. Maybe you sit on the other side, you get anxious quickly and it's scary. Lord Jesus, will you remind me that you are the line of the tribe of Judah and you are with me and you are a warrior who saves. I know that you are strong and mighty, yet my heart doesn't believe that you are strong and mighty enough for me. So, Lord Jesus, help my heart know. I bring my little bucket of faith and say, expand it back to you. Maybe you're sitting and you're saying, "Uh, Lord Jesus, I know that you love me, but I don't know what to do with that. So, Jesus, will you give me eyes to see the people around me? That like you, I would learn, Lord Jesus, to stop and see them. That you would move my heart with compassion to step into offering the hope of heaven and thought and word and deed. Lord Jesus, come, teach us more about who you are and have your way in us. Holy Spirit, use us for the glory of our King. Amen and amen. What does love propel us towards? Does it blind us to differences that might distract us? Does it knock down the law that tries so hard to make us feel like we've earned that love? Does it remind us that we're forgiven and need to forgive others as well? And does it propel us towards going out with the love and peace of Jesus to share it with a world that desperately needs it? I hope you'll think on these things this week. Thanks for listening to our podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at thebranchashland at gmail.com. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, give us a review, and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. See you next time.